Hey guys, in this video we're going to be going over the topic elements, compounds and mixtures for your OCR gateway GCSE chemistry. To go with this video you can use the free revision guide and checklist over on my website and check off what you need to know and then to make sure you fully understand everything you can use the thousands of multiple choice questions which are also up there to help you. Elements, pure things, compounds, two or more different things chemically bonded together, Mixture, lots of different things, some of them chemically bonded, some of them not. When you have mixtures and you want to separate them, there are a number of different things you can do. Distillation, where you're going to separate things off by boiling points, so things that have um, a different boiling point will distill at different temperatures. Evaporation, where we are going to remove the liquid and leave solids that have been dissolved in the liquid in the dish. Filtration, where we have large particles of solid in the liquid. The particles of solid will stay in the filter paper and the liquid will drip through. And fractional distillation where you can take things off at different boiling points. We can use chromatography to separate out compounds and you're going to get probably what you did in class is beautiful, beautiful um, separations by uh, felt pen. We need to make sure that the end of the paper is just in the water. And that you've drawn your start line in pencil. If you draw it in pen, then your start line is going to run as well and that is going to cause you problems. We're going to put a lid on here to stop the solvent evaporating. When we want to work out RF value, we do the distance moved by the spot divided by the distance moved by the solvent. If you have a pure substance, it is going to melt at its melting point. If you have a mixture, it is going to melt over a range of melting points. We can test this by getting some crystals of the pure solution into a very, very thin tube. Putting it into a rather old fashioned here melting point apparatus, you can see that the ends of the very, very thin tube have the crystals in, so we can see that happening. And then they go in the top of the melting point apparatus. And as the temperature rises, this is slowly heated up. We can have a look through the little glass window and see if the um, substance melts at one temperature or whether it melts slowly over a range of temperatures. The periodic table gives us loads and loads of information. The first bit of information it gives us are about groups. Now groups go down the periodic table. Group 1, group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 or group 0. Groups tell us the number of electrons on the outer shell. So things in group 1 are going to have one electron in the outer shell. Things in group 2 are going to have two electrons in the outer shell. Group 6, six electrons in the outer shell. Group 7, seven electrons in the outer shell. Periods go across the periodic table. So here is our first period, the one that everyone always forgets because it's only got hydrogen and helium in. Here is our second period. Here is our third period, and the periods relate to the number of shells that things have. They also remind us how many electrons there are on the, in each shell. So in the first period there are two elements, which means there are going to be two electrons in that shell. In the second period there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements, which means there are going to be eight electrons in that shell. And we can use this information to tell us about the electronic configuration. Here we have magnesium. Here is magnesium on the periodic table and we can see that the number of electrons it has is 12. It is in group 2 and it is in period 3. So that tells us it has 12 electrons in total. It has 2 electrons on the outer shell because it's in group number 2. And it has 3 shells because it is in period number 3. So when we want to draw the electronic configuration of magnesium, we know it's in period 3, it's going to have 3 shells. The first thing we can do is draw 3 shells. 2, 1, 2 go on the first um, shell. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 go on the second shell. That's the most that can fit in that shell. That brings us up to 10. 10, 11, 12, two electrons on the outer shell. From the periods we know that the first shell can hold a maximum of two electrons, the second shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons, the third shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons and then you only need to know up to calcium so another two for your GCSE. 
Metals are going to lose electrons, and when we lose electrons, we get positive charges. And non-metals are going to be gaining electrons, and when we gain electrons, we get negative charges. Things in group 1 are going to lose 1 electron, so are going to be plus 1 ions. Things in group 2 are going to lose 2 electrons, so are going to be plus 2 ions. Things in group 6 here are going to gain 2 electrons, so are going to be minus 2 ions. And things in group 7 are going to gain 1 electron, so are going to be minus 1 ions. Ionic bonding is the transfer of electrons from a metal, which is on this side of the periodic table, to a non-metal on this side of the periodic table. Anything that is in group 1 is going to form a plus 1 ion, group 2 a plus 2 ion, group 6 a minus 2 ion, group 7 a minus 1 ion. Here we are going to make magnesium oxide. Magnesium is in group 2, so it has 2 electrons on its outer shell. Oxygen is in group 6, so it has 6 electrons on its outer shell. In ionic bonding, oxygen is going to keep the electrons that it's already had, and the electrons that were with magnesium are going to be transferred to oxygen. We call these dot and cross diagrams because one element has a dot for electrons and the other element has a cross for electrons. We then draw square brackets around these and indicate the charge. So magnesium has lost two electrons, so it's going to have a plus two charge. Oxygen has gained two electrons, so it's going to have a minus two charge. Here we have sodium, and it has an atomic number of 11, which means it's gonna have 11 protons in the nucleus, and new protons have a positive charge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Now, in the atom, it has 11 electrons drawn on here. Electrons have a negative charge. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now, in an atom, the positive charges and the negative charges cancel each other out. So, the overall charge on the atom is going to be 0. However, when sodium makes an iron, this electron here goes away. So it still has the same number of protons, it's still sodium. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. But it's lost an electron. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it has one more proton than it has an electron, meaning this is going to have an overall positive charge. Here we have sodium chloride. Sodium are the grey bits you can see and chlorine are the green bits you can see. The blue lines are the electrostatic interactions, the electrostatic attractions. Because the way we get you to draw ionic bonding is really false. It's not just one sodium combining with one chlorine. It is this massive, massive, massive lattice of sodiums and chlorines, or whatever we're looking at, bonding with everything else. So one sodium here isn't just going to be bonding with the chlorine um, next to it or the chlorine that it's exchanged electrons to. It's going to be bonded with all of the other ones above it, next to it, behind it, in front of it, everything that it can reach. So this ionic bonding is a massive, massive, massive network, not just the small things that we get you to draw in class. So for ionic compounds, the structure is a giant ionic lattice properties it is going to have a high melting point high boiling point and it is only going to conduct when molten or dissolved This is because the ions need to be free to move.
Covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons between two non-metals, these up here. And these are the common ones you need to know how to draw. For each of these, you need to be able to give the name, the formula, be able to draw it with lines, and be able to draw the dot and cross diagram. So hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride, one element of hydrogen, one element of chlorine. Ammonia, NH3, nitrogen in the middle, three hydrogens coming off around the side. Methane, CH4, carbon in the middle, four hydrogens branching off it. Hydrogen, H2, very simple one there. Chlorine, halogens go around as diatomic molecules. Oxygen, we're getting a bit tricky now, has a double bond. Each line is equal to a pair of electrons. Here we have two lines, that is two pairs of electrons. We need four electrons being shared in the middle. And nitrogen has a triple bond. Two, four, six electrons being shared in the middle. If in the exam they give you a picture and ask you to link the formula of it, you simply need to list what we have. So in the first one we have carbon and we have hydrogen and then we need to count them. One, two, three, four, five. Carbon, five. Hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Last one, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. We have one, two, three carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens and one oxygen so we don't need to put a number after that. It's really important that you write things in the right um, size and in the right place so that is incorrect because your numbers are too big. That is incorrect because your numbers are in the wrong place. For simple covalent compounds such as water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen gas, hydrochloric acid or methane, oxygen gas or water as we have here, they are very very small structures. They have covalent bonding. Their properties is that they have low melting points. and boiling points. They're generally going to be a gas at room temperature or a liquid at room temperature. They do not conduct electricity. For giant covalent compounds, ones made of carbon, such as graphite, diamond, or any fullerenes, or silicon dioxide, they're going to have a giant covalent structure. Their properties are high melting and boiling points, and they do not conduct, and they do not dissolve. With polymers, whether they have cross links or not, are going to determine what their properties are going to be like. So, polymers that do have cross links are very, very fixed in place. These are going to burn upon heating, whereas polymers without cross links are going to melt upon heating because these polymers can slide across each other, whereas these ones cannot slide across each other. Our periodic table hasn't always looked like this. The first attempt at a periodic table was by Newlands in the 1800s. He tried to group things into octaves and break them by pattern, which is a really good idea, except we have oxygen and iron in the same group, and they have very different properties. He grouped them, he arranged them by mass, but he didn't leave any gaps. And he tried to force things in to have similar patterns or properties as other things, and it didn't really work. Mendeleev was the next person to have a go. He also arranged things by mass, but the key thing is that he left gaps in his periodic table. And because he arranged things um, so that they were in groups with similar patterns, and he left gaps, he could predict the properties.
of elements that have yet to be discovered, and he was correct in his predictions. A few years after he developed his periodic table, a couple of new elements were discovered and they fitted in really, really neatly, really nicely to his periodic table. So this week's table was accepted. It's changed ever so slightly by them. We now arrange things by electronic arrangement, but that's a very, very subtle difference. Here we have diamond. It is a giant covalent compound, a giant covalent lattice. It is made of carbon pure carbon, nothing else in there, and each carbon makes four bonds. So in the video you can see that the carbon is the black bits, the covalent bonds are the red bits, and each carbon is bonded to four other carbons. Obviously the ones on the edge aren't bonded to anything, but if you try and look in the middle you can see that they are bonded to four other things. The properties of diamond that make it really useful is that it's incredibly hard. It's very rare, it's hard to find, it's also very beautiful, which makes it very precious. But the main thing is that it's incredibly hard, so we can use it in drills. Graphite is also a giant covalent compound. It is like diamond, pure carbon, but each carbon makes three bonds to other carbons, not four like in diamond. The properties are that it is soft and it conducts electricity. Because it is in sheets and there is a spare electron floating around in between these, that means it will conduct electricity. Graphite is what you find in pencils, graphene is just a single sheet. If we were to compare diamond and uh, graphite, they are both made of pure carbon. They, um, di graphite is made of three carbon carbon bonds, diamond is made of four carbon carbon bonds. Graphite is soft, diamond is hard. Fullerenes are either carbon nanotubules or Buckminster fullerenes, which are balls. These are again all made of pure carbon. They make three carbon-carbon bonds, but unlike graphite, which is soft, these are incredibly hard. Buckminster fullerene can be used as a lubricant in um, things that uh, need lubricating, like electrical cycles or some parts of machines. It can be used for reinforcement, so where you need a very, very strong, very, very light um, things like aircrafts or bicycles. They can also both be used, or in the future be used, for drug delivery. And uh, fullerenes, carbon nanotubules, buckminster fullerenes, um, there are loads and loads of potentials for these, but they haven't been realised yet. Nanotechnology is absolutely fascinating. It is taking atoms and rearranging them into um, specific um, locations or specific sizes um, so that we can use it. It is much, much smaller than technology. It is very small. But it is made up of lots of different atoms. Now, the potentials for this are massive because as we get small, we are increasing the surface area. And when we get this small, things have very, very different properties. Things look see-through, things are flexible, things start to behave very differently to they would um, if they were much, much larger. The potential for this is massive communications, um, drug delivery, personalised medicine. But people are wary about this because it is a new technology. Ouch. Mm, I'll be too